Children's content plays a huge role in the landscape of television, and has spawned many successful franchises that have a lasting impact on American culture. Blue's Clues is a children's show that definitely falls into this category. With a 10-year run on TV, spin-off series, and merchandise galore, to this day the series is fondly remembered by nostalgic teenagers and their parents alike. The show follows Steve as he journeys through his house as well as far off lands, where he attempts to find all three of Blue Puppy's clues to solve the mystery of each episode. But as recognizable as this show is today, there was one point in time where it was actually going to be a little different, and we've never actually seen all the secrets to this original version of the show. Before Blue's Clues' official 1996 TV premiere, in 1995 it took shape as something a little different, called Blueprints. This version of the show was actually the pitch pilot, and contained several differences from the final version, including the absence of Steve's signature green striped shirt, with a red one in its place. Unfortunately, however, this small collection of short clips are the only content to have ever surfaced from this pilot. In 2006 for the 10th anniversary of Blue's Clues, Nickelodeon produced a mini-documentary showcasing the history of the show, and in it, these clips were featured and discussed. Aside from this though, the full pilot has never been aired publicly, and according to the Lost Media Wiki article, after the documentary aired, there was a search effort online that attempted to track down this early version, which included searching for bootleg recordings and files on torrent sites. The only people who have ever seen this full pilot outside of the staff were test groups of preschoolers in 1995 who watched it to give a sense of whether or not the show would be successful and worth pursuing. And due to this fact, the pilot is labeled as lost. So even though Steve's shirt being red is really the most noticeable difference, there could be other secrets lurking within this unaired pilot that we'll only experience if we ever get to see it. But just because we don't have the pilot right now, doesn't mean we won't get to see it eventually. I think it says a lot that Nickelodeon even made mention of it within the mini-doc at all, and at the same time it also proves they still have it in their archives. So perhaps for a future anniversary of Blue's Clues, we can get an official release of it, because I for one think it would be very, very cool to see where a series I grew up with started out. So until the day Blueprints does get a full release, it'll definitely remain a mystery. The Adventures of Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius is an instantly recognized and classic Nicktoon that ran for three seasons from 2002 to 2006, which was met with huge success and long-lasting fans even to this day. But for as recognizable as Jimmy is, a lot went into his development and production to result in the final version we know so well today. Before the TV show, Jimmy Neutron starred in both a 2001 self-titled theatrical movie and even an earlier pilot in 1998 titled Runaway Rocket Boy. But something predating all other Jimmy Neutron material is a prototype short that depicted Jimmy quite differently, and in fact, his name wasn't even Jimmy. The original concept of Jimmy Neutron was drafted sometime in the 1980s, so years later in 1995 at the computer graphics convention called SIGGRAPH, Creator John A. Davis revived this old idea and showcased a new test animation he created titled Johnny Quasar. Hi, I'm Johnny Quasar. And this is my robot dog, Goddard. Bark, 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 bark. From what we can see based on this short clip, the concept looks pretty much the same as the final series, except Johnny has a different design and the CGI is a lot more primitive. But as cool as this short is, and while we do have this clip from it, Technically speaking, it's still lost and currently cannot be viewed in full, since its only known public appearance was at the SIGGRAPH 1995 conference. It's said to be around 40 seconds long, but only 10 seconds worth of video have surfaced over time. For that reason, we don't even know what else it showcases. There's a picture of an earlier design for Johnny's parents from DNA Productions' old website, but we don't know if they actually appear in the short, or any of his friends, despite Quasar branded concept art existing. There are also a handful of additional screenshots which may or may not be from the short, but again, we don't know for sure and they could just be mock-ups. A small clip of the short can also be seen in a promotional reel for Lightwave Animation, but it's very short and doesn't show anything new. So, if this short was only shown off at SIGGRAPH, then how exactly are we going to find the full version? First of all, I think it's pretty safe to say that it's not lingering online anywhere, as DNA Productions' site is where most of this known content comes from, so that's probably the extent of it from them. That being said, it's possible that someone with access to the SIGGRAPH 95 CD-ROM could dump the contents of it, 
But apparently, it's a very rare CD, and on top of that, Johnny Quasar is not even confirmed to be on the CD, since it appears absent from the SIGGRAPH95 archived website. So it seems like things are pretty messy when it comes to finding this, mostly due to the general oddity in regards to its availability. It was shown once at a 1995 conference, and appeared briefly on DNA's website. What now? While all hope may seem lost, let me be the first to tell you, it isn't. As is customary when trying to get to the bottom of lost media mysteries, I made an effort to contact people who had a great deal in the show's creation. Luckily I was able to get in touch with Keith Alcorn, co-creator of Jimmy Neutron and co-founder of DNA Productions. After inquiring about Johnny Quasar, he did some digging around and unfortunately came up empty-handed. However, he reassured me that John A. Davis, the man himself, believes the short is in a larger file storage area that Keith said he'd take a look in when he had the chance. So with that said, you can't get much more reassurance than from the big guys themselves. Johnny Quasar is very likely to still exist, we just have to be patient until the people behind the franchise can deliver. While I don't really want to speculate on what'll happen if they can't find it, I will say that it'll become a much more intensive search effort, and for something that actually might not exist at that point. Unless we gambled with the incredibly rare SIGGRAPH CD-ROM, or found someone who recorded it on VHS in 1995 at the convention, I'd say there's a very small chance of finding the whole thing. But for now we can hold out hope that it still exists, and we'll be able to see the full 40 seconds of Johnny Quasar in time. Johnny Quasar, the 1990s precursor to Jimmy Neutron, was a pretty popular lost media interest. For quite a while, the only remnant of this that we had was a 9 second clip from a larger, full 40 seconds of animation. The community had made quite a few contacts in regards to the creators and developers of the show, ultimately discovering that there were two separate animation clips out there. In regards to these, the consensus had been reached that Jimmy series creator, John Davis, would look for both shorts in his master file storage this fall as he cleaned it out. Well last night, out of nowhere, something amazing happened. The voice actor of Johnny Quasar, YouTube user Hillel H, had possession of both of these shorts, the well-known animation from 1995 and the lesser known rare 1997 animation. Unable to find these clips online, as we were unable to for so long, he decided to upload them for all to enjoy, thus ending another lost media hunt. While I gave Johnny Quasar a stab late last year and remained dormant in regards to the search, it is really amazing to see another one of the topics I covered in my videos found, and it really is a cause for celebration, especially in such the random way that it was uploaded. It kinda goes to show you that, once again, you never know how or when lost media will be uncovered. And generally speaking, this has been a great year for lost media, especially this summer. The MTV Kappa Mikey pilot was found only a few weeks ago, and now Johnny Quasar. The community is making strides in all of these old topics that have been lost for what seems like forever, and now with each new topic uncovered, it brings more awareness and victories to the lost media scene. I'll leave the link to both Quasar shorts in the description because they're really cool to finally be able to see. And with that said, here's hoping more lost media can be uncovered, and best wishes to the community. All throughout the 1990s, Nickelodeon was rich with diversity in their original cartoons. But of course, some of these cartoons are more memorable than others from a modern day standpoint. Ah Real Monsters isn't brought up very often, but is undoubtedly classic and does still maintain a cult following. But if you were into Ah Real Monsters back in the day, you might be excited to have heard it was receiving a made-for-TV movie as the series was coming to an end. And how great is that? A huge finale to a cartoon you enjoy? That couldn't be more awesome! Well, unfortunately, that movie never came to release, and in fact, there's controversy surrounding whether or not it actually existed in the first place. With lots of unverified sources, contradictory claims, and bold statements involving the movie, we need to get to the bottom of this movie's existence. Was it ever planned, and do screenshots actually exist? Or is it all a hoax and the claims of production are false? For starters, A Real Monsters was produced by Klasky Chupo and premiered on Nickelodeon on October 29, 1994. It ran for three years, spanning four seasons, and ended on December 6, 1997. The series was often called dark or gritty, due to the animation style and concept. The movie, on the other hand, was rumored to have begun production in 1998, but was allegedly cancelled for being too dark. Now, the first word of this movie's existence is dated 2009, which is 11 years after its alleged cancellation. The earliest discussion I could find about it is on a Pixar forum in late 2009, but OP does say he heard about the rumor elsewhere. 
At one point, it seems like this was a pretty big discussion topic somewhere, but a lot of the former knowledge doesn't really seem to exist online anymore. So among the garbage of a TV.com listing that says it aired on TV, and the general unverified claims of people who said they've seen parts of it, which they probably just conjured up after seeing the TV.com listing, there are actually two leading areas to look into. The first location is a website called Abe Books, which is some kind of online bookstore. It's not so much the site we're looking at, but one of the items in their inventory. This is apparently a compilation book on cancelled films, and right in the title is Ah Real Monsters. Coincidence? I think so. While I've never really understood what these kinds of books are, I find them occasionally in eBay searches, and from what I gather, they're essentially compilations of random Wikipedia articles or other free online resources, which is confirmed in this other listing on Google Books. Essentially, whatever articles this publisher grabbed at the time the book was printed is what's contained within. And I remember right when this story first broke a couple years ago about that listing, people had assumed it meant without question that Ah Real Monsters the movie was confirmed to exist. And I think it was just really bad timing that something like this had come forward right around the time some people were looking into the movie's existence. Which means unfortunately, this proves nothing and can be discarded. Moving on to the second information area is, ironically, the Ah Real Monsters Wikipedia page. Jumping straight to the bottom is a small write-up about the movie and its cancellation. A lot of it upon second glance is garbage, with that dumb TV.com article and lots of random unnamed sources and random claims of visuals and clips existing. That aside, there is an interesting quote from an alleged animator named Frederick Zowski, which states, The film was cancelled because Viacom bought Paramount. The film wasn't dark, nor were we planning on making it in the first place. Now wait a sec, take a look at that quote again, it sort of contradicts itself. At the beginning it says the film was cancelled, but then later states we weren't planning on making it in the first place. Does that imply it was drafted for fun but was never taken seriously, or does it mean they never had plans to make it so it was cancelled by default? Since that is a very confusing quote, I made an attempt to track down this person to figure out what they meant. Well, I couldn't find a single person by that name, even after thinking Frederick was spelt incorrectly. Klasky Chupo did say they hired European talent, and that name does sound pretty foreign, so maybe he does exist, but I have no idea why there isn't a source next to the quote, or for what reason he could have said it in the first place. It's also odd though, he said Viacom buying Paramount was the reason for its cancellation. But that purchase was conducted four years before the movie allegedly began development. So how does that affect the movie at all? Almost nothing about this quote makes sense. But let's review what we've uncovered here in regards to this movie existing. TV.com listing claiming it aired. Wikipedia compilation book listing the movie. And Frederick Zowski's unsourced quote, whose name doesn't even come up in a search. Not to mention the completely random people and employees who claim to have seen content from it. But perhaps that's the most important piece of evidence to look at here. Those random people claiming they heard it was cancelled because it was too dark. I've always thought it was odd how people claimed its cancellation was due to that reason, since it couldn't have been any worse than the main series, and the crew wouldn't have intentionally made it scarier on purpose. It's for this outlandish cause of cancellation that I believe this movie only lives on in rumor and snowballed by accident as the idea of a movie was passed on through the years. Because even if we assume Frederick Zowski's quote is true, it would still prove that the movie wasn't dark and doesn't exist. But even if the quote is not true, the likelihood of the two dark rumors snowballing into fact over the years still holds. I did try to contact Gabor Chupo and Peter Gaffney, who created the series, but Peter only worked on a few episodes in season 1, and Gabor didn't have any way to be contacted that I could find. So for those reasons, I don't believe the movie could have existed at all, especially when the only surviving proof outlets are the ones I covered. The only way I could be wrong is if at some point in the earlier mid-2000s, something of actual substance came forward on some obscure fan site, and its lack of existence nowadays is what makes all the unverified claims seem false. Keep in mind too, if people ended up believing the cancelled for being too dark theory, then people just as easily could have found one of the many fan scripts involving the movie and confused it as official years ago. When I first started researching this topic I actually thought there was more to it, because there was so much mixed information out there I thought some of it had to be true. But based on my findings I just can't confirm any of it as fact. And until something confirmed to be official comes forward regarding this movie, if it ever does, I don't believe this movie could have existed and there's no way anyone should believe that it did, simply going off of the information that's available online right now. Spongebob is a character with no need for introduction, as he is easily one of the most iconic characters in the world, with a cartoon spanning 9 seasons and a 10th one currently in production. Being as he's had so many episodes produced for the show, this has resulted in many scenes being cut, deleted, or forgotten about. But one episode in particular has been the subject of much controversy, 
due to its unconfirmed nature. I Was a Teenage Gary is an episode from the very first season of SpongeBob SquarePants originally airing in October of 1999. The episode's plot consists of Squidward neglecting to feed Gary when SpongeBob leaves town for the weekend. When SpongeBob does return, he finds Gary in poor condition and calls the doctor to which the doctor gives SpongeBob a syringe of snail plasma, who he tells Squidward to then inject Gary with it. Squidward accidentally injects SpongeBob instead, and he transforms into a snail. Then a while later the syringe finds its way into Squidward, where he then transforms into a snail as well. But let's rewind for a second. This is where the controversy comes in. Right when Squidward gets injected with a snail plasma, there's a wipe transition which cuts right to him already being a snail, without transforming on screen as Spongebob did. As a result, this has sparked debatedly the largest Spongebob deleted scene argument on the internet. Was there a deleted scene of Squidward transforming into a snail, or is this just a poorly placed transition that would lead people to believe something was cut out? As this has been a recurring discussion point in Spongebob communities online, as well as a lost media interest, many have tried to provide evidence either way, either proving or debunking this scene's existence. A very common belief in regards to this scene is that it was only aired once, on the very first time the episode premiered, and was cut by Nickelodeon every time after. Some people have said they've seen the original airing of the episode back when it premiered, and the scene was not there while others have said they vividly remember the scene. Neither of these claims can be verified though, so it only leads way for wild speculation as to reasons why the scene does or does not exist. Some of the theories include that it wouldn't make sense for them to cut the Squidward transforming scene out when they left the Spongebob one in, either cut both out or keep both in, and the Spongebob one was said to be the scarier of the two, so it wouldn't make sense either way. But then you have people reasoning why would they make a second scene of a character transforming into a snail when Spongebob already did that, it would be redundant to do it again. There's even a theory that states Squidward's shell is the same color as his robe from the scene before, so there must have been a scene depicting how the robe transformed into a shell. As for more concrete details, it was once believed that the original 2002 VHS and DVD releases of Halloween contained the scene, however this has been proven false, and it obviously hasn't reappeared on any other DVD releases that contain the episode itself. It was also rumored that the Polish airings of Spongebob episodes were always uncut, meaning that the scene could have been in a foreign language. However, the Polish episodes are exceedingly rare to find, and the only proof is unverified claims saying the scene isn't there. Despite all of this, there is an interesting comment on the Spongebob subreddit that could point the search in a clear direction. Essentially, it goes on to say that the wipe transition is noticeably different than the typical bubble effect more commonly used. So if someone were to watch all of the season 1 episodes and count how many times a wipe was used without the bubbles, it could be a clear indication of whether or not something was cut. Now, I would say out of everything that anybody has ever said about this scene, that is the most definitive kind of lead that you can get which would determine whether or not the scene ends up being real or fake. Because to say this scene doesn't exist just because it would have been found by now if it did completely goes against the whole idea of lost media. We need more than forum claims and unsourced material to determine for absolute certainty whether or not this scene exists somewhere, or if it's just a rumor. Kappa Mikey is an American cartoon from the mid-2000s that parodied Japanese anime. Some people remember this show fondly, and others don't. But whatever your opinion on the show is, that doesn't stop the collective desire to uncover its lost media. Before Mikey premiered as a Nicktoons cartoon, its earlier incarnation was designed for MTV in the form of a pitch pilot. This pilot was created sometime in 2004, and ever since then it had eluded all traces online. Fascinated with this more adult take on the show, I had a new interest in the series, and I set out on a quest, late last year, to find this pilot. I largely documented the search in my original video, but generally speaking, after only a few weeks, I had contacted many former employees who worked on the show, mostly to no avail regarding the pilot. While most of my hope was gone, the last contact I made was with the series director. At the time of the initial exchange, it largely went nowhere, and I never thought I was going to hear back from him. Until just the other day, many months later, that I see a message from him in my inbox. Almost immediately, all my Mikey experiences come racing back to me, the late night searching for contacts, the passion I had put into my original search video, and my ultimate desire to have this pilot unearthed as my number one lost media interest. There it was, a link to the full, original vision that Mikey had taken more than 10 years ago. This was the MTV pitch pilot. It was found. If you guys haven't seen the pilot yet, you need to check it out. The link will be in the description. 
I couldn't be more thankful to the director for taking the time to look through his portfolio and ultimately unearth this lost piece of animation for me and every community that has a part in it. Throughout my journey, I also met a ton of really cool people and fan bases I otherwise never would have found on my own, so the whole experience really means a lot to me. But if there's one thing I want to pass on to you guys about lost media hunting, it's to be patient and never count out a source. When I started this search, I had the hopes of finding the pilot almost instantly. All I had to do was contact someone with it and boom, search over. Little did I know I had contacted someone with it, but it would take a lot of time to uncover. And after I hadn't spoken to the director in months, I really thought it was a dead end. So seeing him send me that pilot was something truly magnificent. The pilot itself is quite interesting to say the least. Like I said, it's best experienced if you watch it for yourself, but I can definitely see the MTV influence within the style. There actually is some confusion with the pilot when compared to these images that have been floating around. While I initially thought the pilot would look more like this, it turns out this is just promotional art that was used on the MTV press releases. Between the time when these images were released and the creation of the pilot, it seems like the animators simplified the designs to make them better suited for the animation. But now that the pilot has been found, it seems like that's largely the end of the popular interest in Kappa Mikey. Hopefully with this pilot being found, it'll bring in some new fans to the series and revive the interest people have in it. The complete series has never been released on DVD, and there were never any collectibles made for the series. Unfortunately, Handmade Films currently owns the license, to which they've ultimately done nothing with it. Maybe with some new interest we can get the ball rolling on some new Mikey releases, or maybe even the continuation of the series? For now though, it seems like Mikey will at least get some more attention through the pilot, even if we never get anything new from the franchise ever again, which I think is a shame. The show's concept is such a solid idea that I'm still saddened by the fact that it could have become bigger. But if there's one thing for certain, it's that the mystery of the Kappa Mikey MTV pitch pilot is a mystery no more. Within the lost media community, there are many different categories that different lost media can fit into. Perhaps one of the most intriguing is the subcategory called Existence Unconfirmed. What this refers to is a piece of lost media which cannot be verified to exist. Topics like the Angry Beavers Cuff Together pilot and the missing astrology with Squidward shorts have some evidence that support their existence but are not 100% known to actually be in existence. Today we're going to take a look at another piece of existence unconfirmed lost media that has sort of reached a mythic status ever since the story about it was told years ago. It's the early 1990s, where Ren and Stimpy voice actor Billy West is at the Spumco Animation Building, located in Los Angeles. At one time, a scraggly kid walks in completely unannounced and says he wants to write a song for Ren and Stimpy. Annoyed at this solicitor, the executives shrug him off and throw out the song that he gives them. The shocking part in all of this is that the solicitor was actually a musician, Kurt Cobain of Nirvana. This story comes from episode 49 of the Nerdist podcast, which was recorded back in 2010. One day the scraggly kid comes in and said he wanted to write a song for Ren and Stimpy, and they, they said, yeah, that's great, and they threw it in the wastebasket. Oh. It was Kurt Cobain. Oh, <laughs> shit! Oh, that's an awesome story! Yeah, I think John was like, you know, who does this guy think he is? Who are all these people think they are coming in here? To this day, Billy West's recollection from seven years ago of an event that happened more than 20 years ago is the only shred of evidence we've ever heard regarding Cobain's effort to write a song for Ren and Stimpy. As a result, this has led to a bevy of speculation and discussion surrounding the validity of West's story. And to add to the confusion, whichever way you look at the story, none of it really makes much sense. So for starters, Ren and Stimpy premiered in August of 1991 which is also when Nirvana's hit, Smells Like Teen Spirit, debuted on the radio, with the album, Nevermind, releasing a month later in September, and hitting number one in January of the following year. Now, for Kurt Cobain to have been shrugged off by Spumco, you'd have to assume that he made his pitch before he really became famous, a possible time frame of early spring or summer 1991. But at the same time, Ren and Stimpy was not airing at the time, so how would Kurt have liked the show enough, or even known about it, to want to write a song for it? Well, the Ren and Stimpy pilot actually debuted at a film festival. I read online that Kurt was into collecting bootleg VHS tapes of things like that. Putting two and two together, there is a chance that Kurt could have seen a bootleg recording of the pilot, liked the show, and made a pitch before he was famous, and before the show actually aired on TV. 
Not only would he have done this out of his own enjoyment for the show, but maybe he thought it would help get his name out there, since again this would have been before Nirvana hit it big. Curiously though, we also have to wonder how Billy West could have known that this scraggly kid was Kurt Cobain, if this was indeed before Nirvana became famous with their song and album. I guess he could have been into them while they were still unpopular, but that's something I wouldn't know. If that theory stretches things a little too far for you, then we can take a different approach, this time from the perspective of after Ren and Stimpy began airing, and after Smells Like Teen Spirit hit the radio. This would be around the fall of 1991. From this angle, we can theorize that maybe after Ren and Stimpy had begun airing on TV, Kurt watched the cartoon and liked it enough to want to make a song pitch to Spumco. However, at this time, Nirvana could have just been taking off, so Kurt wasn't to the point of national stardom, once again resulting in him being shrugged off. In this way, it's also a fair assumption to say that the Spumco guys weren't following Nirvana's rise to fame, and if Kurt had actually looked scraggly like Billy West says, that only hurt his chances more of being identified as the guy from Nirvana. By January 1992, Nevermind had hit the number one album spot in the country, so there's no way Kurt and Nirvana's fame would go unrecognized at that point. Meaning that if this event is real, it definitely would have happened somewhere between the spring and fall of 1991. But there are so many gaps in the story that it's really hard to figure out what happened. How did Billy West recognize Kurt when no one else did? Why would Kurt have bothered to write a song for a cartoon when his band had begun rocketing into stardom? Or on the contrary, why would he have wanted to write a song for a cartoon yet to air on TV? I did find a picture online of Kurt with a Ren plush toy, which is something that definitely would have been made after the cartoon got popular. So maybe this is evidence that Kurt became a fan and made his pitch later on in the timeline. And maybe that means the Spumco guys just didn't like Kurt or Nirvana. I reached out to Billy West just to see if he had any more details to add on to what he's already said, but he didn't get back to me. Honestly though, there's no guarantee he'd really have anything else to add. The original mention of it in the podcast was so brief, and it's been so many years since the story came out that it's likely he would have given more details by now if there was something more to say. And unfortunately, we can't ask Kurt himself because he committed suicide. His estate has never come out publicly with any kind of word regarding this either, so even if a demo tape did still exist, it would be a wonder how it would ever be found. Though that also makes me wonder what exactly this song is supposed to be. Some articles you read online state that this was the theme song to the show, but Billy West never said it was a theme song, and upon listening to the voice clip over and over again, he never actually says it was a tape that was thrown in the trash, just that Kurt wanted to write a song, and that the executives threw it in the trash. For the time being though, it seems we'll never know. Never know what exactly Kurt Cobain pitched to the Spumco executives, or whether or not this fabled event actually exists. A lot of people have made points that Billy West's story, being the only story to ever surface about this, is certainly odd. But if Kurt was unrecognized and rejected, then wouldn't that make sense? The details seem to run in a circle, and it's truly mysterious to wonder if there actually was some kind of Kurt Cobain association with Ren and Stimpy that took the shape of existence. But until we get some official word or concrete proof in some way, this is one rumor that might never be solved, and so it remains a mystery. The Angry Beavers was a cartoon series on Nickelodeon airing from April 19, 1997 to November 11, 2001. And just like every cartoon series ever produced, it all started from a short test episode, more commonly referred to as a pilot. And just like many, many other pilot episodes to other cartoon series, one of the two pilot episodes produced in 1994 for The Angry Beavers remains lost, and currently cannot even be confirmed to exist. The first of the two Angry Beavers pilots was called Snowbound, an episode where Norbert and Daggett try to find ways to pass the time after being snowed in. This formerly lost pilot was found in February of 2013 on a bootleg DVD and is now available to watch online. The more mysterious and interesting of the two pilots is known as Cuffed Together. The plot of this episode, though only a rumor, involves the Beavers being arrested after Daggett destroys an expensive wooden statue, and they manage to escape while handcuffed together, as the title fittingly suggests. As previously stated, there is very little concrete information in regards to this pilot, and only rumors of its existence have surfaced. The most popular of these rumors involve claims that viewers in Europe and Latin America have seen this episode when it aired on their foreign Nicktoons TV equivalents. Of course, this cannot be verified, and according to this fan site, the fact that someone by the name of Javier Vera who lives in Chile apparently saw the episode twice seems very fishy. 
A second and completely different claim states that Cuffed Together was once shown in theaters before the movie titled The Best Christmas Pageant Ever. I couldn't find any information regarding a cinematic viewing of this movie, so I have no idea where that rumor could have started from or why an Angry Beavers episode would have been aired before it. However, I did find an episode guide compiled by a fan in which he makes a point to talk about the two pilots. He goes on to casually talk about the plot of Snowbound, but then goes on to mention the rumor of Cuffed Together. Most importantly, he claims that writers John Requa, Glenn Ficarra, and Mika Wright have never heard of Cuffed Together. Interestingly, I looked up the names of these writers and surprisingly, they had only been working on the show from 1998 and onward, when the pilot was created in 1994. This means that it's reasonable to assume that these writers have never heard of the pilot because it was from before their inclusion to work on the show, essentially discrediting their word on it. I actually attempted to contact some of the show's cast myself, including the creator, Mitch Schauer. Unfortunately, the email address on his website is dead and I can't find any other contact information for him. I've also tweeted both Beaver voice actors about this episode to see if they perhaps remembered it, but again, I didn't get any reply. Whether or not this pilot exists remains to be seen, but who's to say a bootleg copy won't appear on YouTube someday like Snowbound did? But until then, this episode remains a mystery. For as long as I've been in the Lost Media community, I've noticed the constant fascination with Lost Kids show content. This is the kind of stuff you'd see on PBS Kids or Nick Jr. Personally, I love searching for this kind of stuff and unearthing the earliest iterations of content that influenced the kids who grew up with it. Recently, there seems to be an increase of interest when it comes to kids' media, and likewise has inspired the search for another piece of lost media, the Super Y Pitch Pilot. If you don't know what Super Y is, well I'm sure you're kinda familiar with its characters, as one of them was stolen and used for an antivirus commercial, which became a pretty popular meme. However, the real show debuted on PBS Kids in the late 2000s and ran through the mid-2010s, becoming very popular. It uses CGI animation and depicts the characters with exaggerated yet realistic features, each one of them with a signature costume as well. Though you might be surprised to see what the original iteration of the show was going to be like. The Pitch Pilot, created in 1999, uses a completely different style of animation, that being stop motion. On top of this style change, the show itself looked a lot more abstract, with softer colors and an overall more childish tone. According to summaries of the plot, the main character, named Super Y, is 6 centimeters high and lives in a children's library. When he has a question that needs an answer, he asks popular storybook characters to help. But unfortunately, we can't really get a grasp on how this concept is illustrated or even how smooth the animation is, because the pilot is lost. Which is largely where the mystery begins. The visuals that I've been referencing came from the old website of the company that animated it, Cup of Coffee Animation and no videos or clips can currently be found. However, the pilot did have a screening at the Annecy Film Festival in the year 2000. Its runtime was 9 minutes long, and it even won an award for its educational value at the event. Despite the praise Super Y received, Nick Jr. did not pick up the series when it was pitched to them, and after that, it disappeared, until the PBS revival we know of today. Though rumors have since popped up which claim during its dormant years, the pilot aired on Nick Jr. and was once available on the Cup of Coffee website, but these are unconfirmed and I couldn't find any proof of it myself. That's not to say there hasn't been new content found since the search for this pilot began, and I have a few leads I've been trying to get in contact with who should know something as well. Once the topic started gaining attention, one of the first pieces recovered was a reggae tune that was supposedly used as the pilot's theme song. It got passed around quite a bit and was reposted to YouTube, where discussion of its legitimacy came into question. Thankfully, the original upload was able to be tracked down, where it was discovered that the song came from the composer's own website, proving it's real. Though it was eventually discovered that the song went unused in the pilot itself. It was still a cool piece to find and got the ball rolling for more leads to be found, which is where things get a little strange. I had started looking more in depth into the pilot at this time and mostly only had wiki articles to use as sources. While none of the articles I read were too detailed, there seemed to be comment threads that popped up discussing not only names connected to the pilot, but also rumors that someone in the community had already found it. Taking that with a grain of salt, this began my contact search as I started to find names buried online who stated they were associated with the Super Y pilot or cup of coffee animation. I surprised myself with who I was able to find. 
most notably a storyboard artist who worked on the pilot itself, and a cup of coffee executive who oversaw all the projects they were working on back in the 90s. They were both contacted weeks ago, but I unfortunately never heard back. As of the making of this video, they've been contacted through different addresses, so here's hoping to get in touch with them eventually. While I was waiting for them to reply, I had contacted Cup of Coffee Animation itself, thinking they might still have a copy in their archives, but I never heard anything back from them either. Finally, I had thought about contacting Angela Santamero, the creator of this pilot, as well as Blue's Clues, but she must get dozens of messages, so I figured this one would go unanswered. While this was wrapping up, I went back to the comments section and noticed that the threads had been updated to claim that the guy with the pilot was going to upload it, around the same time I sent my contacts messages. While I would have been disappointed all my searching was for nothing, it would have been okay if it meant getting this thing found much quicker. Unsurprisingly, that didn't happen, as the user who claimed to have it was just trolling, as I figured from the beginning. However, I would argue that maybe it ended up working out, because it got me to dig deeper and actually make progress in getting this found. This topic in particular doesn't seem like something that'll be impossible to find. There seems to be enough people out there who know about it, and Cup of Coffee is still around. I have a feeling Super Y will find its way online eventually. Until that happens, however, the Super Y pitch pilot from 1999 will remain a mystery. Hey guys, it's L Superstar Q here, and today I wanted to do an update on the Kablam episode 29 video that I did a while ago at this point. So since making that video, I've learned quite a bit more about episode 29, and I wanted to kind of make an update expressing what I found and how at this point I'm pretty much convinced the episode is fake. So in the last video, I was pretty evenly split between whether or not it was real or whether or not it was fake. I was leaning more towards believing it because from what I had found and, you know, from... You know, saying that Mark Merrick left a comment on a fan site that I can't find, you know, that's not proof. But ironically, at this point, that is like the most definitive proof that I can get. Now, for the record, I want to clarify that yes, you know, from a generalized perspective, this isn't proof because it's just a claim. The screenshot of the comment hasn't been found. You can't find the fan site on, you know, a regular Google search anymore. But long story short, I started talking to the admin of the Kablam Wiki about this, Kablammer 1992. And he pretty much said to me that no one took a screenshot of the comment at the time, and the website is pretty much lost now because, you know, it just died from inactivity, and you can't find the URLs anywhere and stuff, so it largely comes down to trust, but, I mean, to be honest, this guy is the admin of the Kablam Wiki, and he says that he was on, you know, the fan site when it existed and stuff, so it's like, why would he sabotage his own site and his own, you know, passion for Kablam by trying to perpetuate that this episode you know, is fake when it actually is real. Like, it doesn't make sense. So we said that he actually still knows the person who started that website, the Kablam fan site, and that when they have time, they're going to go back through the Wayback Machine, try and use the URLs to actually get a screen cap of the comment to hopefully put this, you know, rumor to rest for good. But until then, there is more reason to believe this episode is fake if what I just said about the comment and everything wasn't good enough. And that's essentially how episode 29 could just be a huge confusion of other Kablam episodes. So to this day, Kablam is still one of Nickelodeon's most obscure shows. It was never, you know, released on VHS normally or DVD normally. And, you know, there was a point where you couldn't find a lot of the episodes online. And even back in the day, I've heard that it wasn't aired very well. So the point that I'm making is that there are a lot of other episodes that people could have kind of remembered incorrectly that would lead this episode 29 thing to happen. And I'm not even just talking about people nowadays, you know, who are trying to remember back to like 1998 or whenever episode 29 was supposed to premiere. No, I mean like when the hoax even started. So I guess it was originally listed episode 29 on Wikipedia and TV.com guides in like the early 2000s. So that was around the time Kablam was ending its run on TV anyway. And it's highly possible that, you know, granted the person wasn't trolling who originally wrote it, that they were confusing, you know, maybe episode 29 with Resistance is Futile, which has kind of an award ceremony show, and also the Life with Loopy special, which was also done in an award ceremony type of fashion, both of which aired around the same time that episode 29 theoretically would have premiered. And another note of interest is that I found a website from September 1998 stating that the Life with Loopy special was going to premiere in October of that year which debunks the theory that the Life with Loopy special was made out of the remnants of episode 29 because it was already confirmed to air before episode 29 would have premiered. 
And of course, nowadays, you know, I'm sure there are tons of people confusing episode 29 with these two episodes, just in general. Plus, keep in mind that Kafun and Just Chillin' have yet to resurface online, so some people might be confusing some scenes from either of those two episodes with what episode 29 was supposed to be about. Like, I think Just Chillin' was supposed to be about um, Henry and June realizing that their show was coming to an end, something about, like, low budget and stuff, so maybe some people thought that that had to do with, like, an award ceremony thing. You know, I mean, there's a million different ways you could spin it, but, you know, episode confusion is a large part of what could have happened in this case. Also, there's a Nickelodeon book called Not Just Cartoons, Nicktoons that lists Kablam as having 47 to 48 episodes. So at the time that was written, allegedly, Just Chillin' was not known to exist. So essentially, 48 episodes would be including all the known ones, Kafun, and episode 29. But then once we found out that Just Chillin' existed, that would have knocked episode 29 out of like the 48th slot, we would have had Just Chillin' be the 40th episode, and that would round out all the episode numbers, meaning that 29 doesn't fit in the episode list. Not to mention that there actually is an episode in the list that's numbered 29, so there can't really be two episode 29s. And I thought I would make mention of this just because it's somewhat relevant. I guess it kind of just came up, but I guess someone found a new screenshot from 4chan, which allegedly has, you know, a picture of the episode being run on a TV, and I guess the original poster said that he found it from a Nickelodeon fan site years and years ago, but you know guys, this is 4chan we're talking about, and I think everything I've pretty much just covered kind of debunks this. I'm gonna go and say it's fake, and I think that pretty much does it for proof why this episode isn't real, and I know that there are gonna be some reasonable doubters, and you know, I, I kind of sympathize with you because I agree, you know, just like, you want to have that hope that you know, this is real or that, like, you know, this actually could exist, but just from what I've researched and stuff, I have to kind of convince myself that, uh, it's probably not real at this point as much as I would have liked to have seen it be real. And with that said, that does it for this Kablam Episode 29 update video, so thanks for watching, guys. I'm LSuperSonicQ, and as always, until the next video, Finn. Hey guys, it's Elsie Sonic Q here with a video that will probably be the last one involving me talking about Kablam episode 29 because at long last we finally have definitive proof, conclusive proof, evidence from Mark Merrick himself that debunks episode 29 as being the award show alleged kiss scene and all that stuff that people thought it once was. So despite having talked about this episode in two other videos and pretty much saying that I think this is fake and everything about it is fake, there were still a lot of people who said, no, this is real because I remember seeing it, or no, this is real, I have it on VHS, yeah, right. Or, yeah, this is real for any number of reasons. But today, Mark Merrick on his website, his official website under the Kablam page, he has uploaded some videos for us. Now, the most important video that I feel is here is the one called Episode 29. So upon first glance, you'd say, whoa! This is episode 29. This is the last episode. This is the one that everyone has said they've watched, but no one could find for however many years it's been lost. So you click it and you think you're going to see an award show kiss scene, but guess what it actually is? This episode is actually your logo here. An episode that was known to exist that isn't, quote, lost. It's just a regular Kablam episode. So what does this mean? It means that episode 29 is a normal Kablam episode, it doesn't exist, Mark Merrick would have uploaded it if it did exist. This is the real episode 29 that was made for the series, and he uploaded it and called it episode 29 because he wanted to show proof, I guess without actually saying the kiss scene was fake, you know, that this is what it is, it's not what people say it is. Because in conjunction with episode 29, right next to it is Kafun, which was an episode that was lost for quite some time, so it all ties into the lost media and the rumors it kind of sparked about episode 29. So with that said, we can finally put episode 29 to rest. All the speculation, all the rumors, all the thoughts about it, all the evidence, everything like that has finally come to an end. And you want to know what, guys? Despite this, I guarantee you there will still be people saying, well, Mark Merrick is trolling us. He really has the episode in his closet or on some kind of tape that he's never going to release. And you want to know what, guys? That's okay. You guys can think that. But this, as it stands, is more than enough proof, much more than enough proof, that episode 29 is fake, it never existed, and the mystery has been solved. 
So I'm Mel Supersonic Q. Thanks for watching, and until the next video, Finn. It's not often that I make update videos for past topics I've covered on the channel, because in most cases the updates are so minor that they can either be pinned as a comment, or the entire video would just be new speculation based on what the comment section said. Previously, Kablam Episode 29 and Kappa Mikey are the only topics that I made consistent updates for, but today we can add another topic to that list, because I have some new information that gives the search effort some food for thought, and might result in a consensus being reached that there are no other astrology with Squidward shorts to be found beyond the ones we currently have. Last summer when I made my first video on the topic, I discussed the series as a whole, and weighed the likelihood of all 12 zodiac signs existing as shorts versus the popular belief of only 8 of them existing. In the case of 8 out of 12 existing, it only leaves 2 signs, Virgo and Libra, lost. My issue with this theory is that it didn't make sense to assume Virgo and Libra exist with literally no evidence online, while the existence of the remaining 4 signs was dismissed, with equally no evidence to back that up. As a counter-argument, I propose the possibility of all 12 signs existing simply due to the fact that with no concrete evidence, anything should be possible regarding the missing signs. To put it bluntly, the astrology with Squidward search effort has been scattered and directionless ever since the Virgo and Libra shorts were believed to exist. But on the contrary to all that belief, I have some new information which strongly suggests that they don't exist at all, and it makes a lot of sense. The majority of this information comes to me in an email I received from a viewer named Jeff Bullock. He was researching the topic and found some information regarding Virgo and Libra I missed back when I was making my original video. So let's take a look at this new information and what it means for the shorts. So as I stated previously, my biggest issue with the claims of Virgo and Libra's existence was the fact that no one could supply any evidence or proof that these shorts existed outside of their memory, and furthermore, no one even had an original source of this information. Well, I think the original source was actually hidden in plain sight all along. Remember the SB Mania thread about astrology with Squidward? I started my search here, and it's been cited in many places since the interest in these shorts grew. Anyway, someone in the thread attempted to explain the series, and does so by taking a write-up about the series and reposting it. The source of this write-up is Wikipedia, but let's take a look at what it says about Virgo and Libra. Well actually, Virgo is totally absent from this list, but this list is also missing some of the shorts that we've found, so that's no big deal. We'll come back to Virgo later. But as for Libra, Squidward is credited with it, but in addition to possibly being Tauros instead, as indicated with the ore placed there, we know Patrick is Tauros, and it even says so earlier in the article. So it's a bit contradictory and confusing to say that Squidward could have been Tauros to any extent. But that's not all. Look at Plankton. It says Scorpio and Leo. Again, we know that he actually is Leo, but where does this Scorpio bit come from? I have no idea, but the gist I'm getting from this article is that the original author wasn't very sure about all of the shorts himself. This thread is from 2006, but that also means that this Wikipedia information is from around that time too. Being so, we come to the conclusion that Libra can be sourced from a 2006 Wikipedia article. Considering how popular this thread is, I'm guessing it's where a majority of the Libra believers originally got the information that it exists. Plankton being Scorpio is probably not talked about and never caught on because by the time this thread popped up in every modern day astrology with Squidward Google search, we had the Leo short featuring him, and as far as we know, there aren't any characters who were featured in more than one short. Still the point stands that this information is so off compared to what we know now that I certainly wouldn't believe most of it. So what about Virgo? Well like I said earlier, it wasn't on the 2006 Wikipedia list, but instead can most commonly be found from a 2007 post on dxpnet.com. Here, Pearl is claimed to be Virgo, which I again used in my original video where I failed to notice that Wikipedia is the source. Jeff looked through the Spongebob article's history on Wikipedia, and found in April 2006, Pearl being Virgo was added to the page. But something interesting about this, is that the person who edited that small portion into the article, apparently used to frequent many cartoon wikis, and edited the trivia sections on them. He was very active in editing for that April month, but he doesn't seem to be editing articles anymore, and there's no contact information for him, so we can't really get a first-hand answer about this particular Virgo edition. Jeff proposed that we look through all of his other trivia edits and see if they're factual, but then stated the SB episode Will of a Birthday was released the next month because Pearl's birthday is in May. Even though May birthdays aren't Virgos, maybe he just added it because he heard of the episode and thought that Pearl should have had a zodiac sign. 
So this means that once again, the most popular source of Pearl being a Virgo online is again traced back to a Wikipedia article. But we can dig even deeper than this into Wikipedia. As early as August 2005, the very first astrology with Squidward information was added to Wikipedia. Patrick, Spongebob, and Plankton were the only characters included, notably with Plankton being labeled as Scorpio again. Virgo, Libra, and the rest aside, you'd think that since this is the earliest documentation of the series online, that it would also be the most accurate, right? Well, as I said before, we know that Plankton is Leo, and aside from the fact that Scorpio isn't even discussed as possibly existing, I again highly doubt that they used the same character for multiple shorts even if it did exist, so this information is again probably false. Luckily, there was actually a username connected to this early edit, so Jeff found an email and contacted the editor who added this information. Unfortunately, the editor didn't recall anything about astrology with Squidward, though did confirm that he wasn't even the original author. He had merged that information with the main Spongebob article, so it was just a copy-paste job, claiming that the original information was added by a couple of anonymous users earlier that summer. Essentially, it once again means that what we're looking at is random Wikipedia edits as the source of this information. And what does that leave us with? Well, almost nothing to point us in any kind of direction that there are more shorts out there. The tone of my original video was more to the point in believing that all 12 shorts existed, but now after going through this new information, I'm more inclined to believe that only 6 of the 12 zodiac signs were in fact made into shorts, simply because of these origin stories. Literally Wikipedia articles with lots of contradictions and inaccuracies are the only sources we have. In fact, when I was discussing Virgo's addition to the article in April 2006, look at what was written for Squidward. Now it says he could be Scorpio or Libra, even though Plankton still sports that title right above. Additionally, that original SB Mania thread where Libra's popularity arose from was posted four months after Virgo was added back in April. But look, where's Virgo? So it had to have been removed sometime in between. And Scorpio? I don't even know how people could have said that. At the end of the day, Wikipedia is the only living source for Virgo and Libra, and this information was reposted on websites that everyone runs into when they google the topic. So that leads me to believe these shorts' existence was perpetuated by people believing they're real simply by reading these popular websites and not realizing Wikipedia is the source, which is pretty much what I did when I made my original video. And no, that clip of Virgo that was briefly passed around is fake, the quality of this short doesn't match up with the episode before it, and this image of Pearl is one of the first ones to show up in Google Images. So with that said, hopefully this update video gives you some more things to consider about astrology with Squidward. I just don't see how people can insist that Virgo and Libra are real when there's only been wishy-washy Wikipedia articles that point in random directions without anything concrete. I mean, I still get comments on my Teenage Gary video of people claiming they remember the scene, even though we've proven it doesn't exist. So like anything else, I don't believe the memory claim. And like I said at the beginning of the video, I think there's more of a chance that the six shorts that we've found already are all the series encompasses since it's a perfect half zodiac. 8 out of the 12 is a really weird ratio for the series to end on. But anyway, that's all there is to currently know about the status of this topic. I'd really like to thank Jeff Bullock again for doing this research and bringing it to my attention, and like I said, this topic is still popular and discussed, so maybe one day we'll have official confirmation one way or another if there are more shorts to find. But until then, they'll remain a mystery. There's something I really miss about the interests people used to have in Lost Media. Back a few years ago, it seemed like search efforts would rise up for every topic no matter how small it was and I really enjoyed getting to discover those kinds of topics that weren't super mainstream. But nowadays, I feel like I have to dig for those kinds of things, and it seems like most people aren't interested in them. But sometimes receiving a message with a topic so unknown that it evokes that nostalgic feeling is the pick-me-up I need. The other day I got a message on the Lost Media Wiki from that gaming a-hole with a question about a special he had seen from his childhood but had slipped through the cracks and gone completely undocumented. The special is fittingly called Cartoon Lost and Found, and is hosted by Adam West, who plays the part of an archivist collecting old cartoons from the 50s, 60s, and 70s that everyone has forgotten about. I had never heard anything about this special before, and apparently neither had most other people, since that gaming a-hole had only been able to find a short promo. It aired sometime in the late 80s or early 90s on Nick at Night, but this was the only evidence it ever existed, with no credits on Adam West's filmography or mention of the special in relation to Nickelodeon or Nick at Night. 
My interest was piqued and I decided to take a shot at unearthing more of this special, so I read through the article A-Hole compiled with all the information he knew. I soon discovered that he had dug up a second promo advertising the special, but also the first 15 minutes of it, which both had been sitting on YouTube for years. This is a great place to start, but we need more, and while the article provided a lot of background about the topic, there weren't really any leads to pull from it. I noticed a link to someone having mentioned its existence from a sitcom forum in 2007, but it didn't lead anywhere. Something I hadn't done yet was watch the promo even though it was one of the first things A-Hole showed me, so I gave it a watch and in doing so came to my first lead. I checked the comments of the video with the hopes that someone knew more about it or even had more content from it, and to my surprise I was greeted with a thread that asked for exactly that. The uploader replied, and while not having the special himself, linked two other YouTube videos which were allegedly parts 1 and 2. The first URL takes you to the part that Ahole added to the article, so we already have this one documented. The second URL, however, leads to a video that was deleted and is no longer available. I tried looking through the Wayback Machine or other means that might have the video saved, but they all proved useless. I thought about contacting these channels in the slight chance they'd know who uploaded this alleged part 2, but these channels in themselves are really old and pretty inactive. I really thought I had ended the search in a matter of hours, but it doesn't look like that's the case, so it was time to step up the search and work some LSSQ magic to make new leads and contacts from simple Google searches, and soon enough I struck gold. I found the resume of the senior programmer director for Nick at Night and TV Land, so I sent him a message asking if he knew anything about the special. But that wasn't good enough for me. Even though contacting people is a very effective way of getting answers, it's not always the most reliable when you consider wait times or the fact that your message might never get read. So I conjured up some more magic and went back to Google, digging even deeper than before. There had to be more out there on this special, considering Nick at Night and Adam West are the subjects. Someone, somewhere, had to have seen this and made some kind of mention of it. Well, after looking very closely at the first few pages of results, I noticed a newspaper archive site with preview text that mentioned Cartoon Lost and Found by Name. I clicked it open to discover that I needed a subscription to read the full paper, until I realized by scrolling down you could read the typed version instead. This revealed an entire blurb about the special and described it in detail, including its air date which was October 29th, 1989 at 8.30pm. However, what really jumped out to me was the premise of the special. In short, it says that Nick at Night discovered a bunch of old cartoons in the dark recesses of the TV Land building, and has hired Adam West to look over them. Now I'm not sure how much of this is fact and how much of it is plot written for the special, but remember the guy I contacted who listed Nick at Night and TV Land on his resume? This might not be a coincidence, as Viacom is TV Land's parent organization, same as Nickelodeon and Nick at Night. This leads me to believe that this entire special was created from the fact that Nick at Night actually found archives of abandoned cartoons in the TV Land building and decided to make a special highlighting their existence. Now that's really cool, it makes me want to find the whole special even more. However, it doesn't get much easier from here as the newspaper article provided no further leads to follow. I did a little more looking around and the only other things I was able to find involved comments on a thread from 6 years ago which talked about interesting YouTube finds. Cartoon Lost and Found is mentioned by one user, and another posts those same YouTube links to part 1 and 2 of the special that I mentioned earlier. Though what's curious about them is that according to another comment, the part 2 that we believe to be the part that's still lost wasn't actually the continuation of the special, but something else entirely that was mixed in with the first part by accident. So it's possible even if we found this video, it might not be what we're looking for. Unfortunately my search ends there, as there was nothing else I could find online, but there's still some hope that the rest of this thing will get found. That gaming a-hole says that there's a chance he recorded the whole special back in the day, but that it would take a really long time to go through their entire VHS collection. We're also not completely sure how long the special ran for, or if there are any spin-offs of it. I wanted to believe it was an anthology series like Toon Heads, and there could be more episodes or content out there, but that doesn't seem to be the case, and that's really odd. To think that Nick at Night allegedly found all these cartoons rotting away in a building, bothered to put together a special which highlights their relevance, and then just never did anything else with the idea or cartoon library is shocking. No one really knows for sure what the intentions of the special were, but the current consensus is that this was a test to see if old cartoons were marketable on Nick at Night. 
and I guess to the executives of the network, they weren't. The whole existence of this special is still really interesting, and I hope we can get it unearthed. But Cartoon Lost and Found will remain lost and found until the entire special can be viewed, which leaves it a mystery for now. Hey guys, it's L Supersonic Q, and welcome to the first video of October. So, for the past couple years, I've been wanting to have this, like, October spooky month of Halloween lost media videos, and that just hasn't really happened for a variety of different reasons, but hopefully this year will be different, and we'll have a lot of different lost media Halloween-related videos, and today's topic is going to kick that off, because this is a topic I've been wanting to do for, like, three years or so, and it just hasn't happened, but finally, I decided this would be a really great time to talk about this. So Kablam! It was a cartoon variety show that aired on Nickelodeon in the late 90s and early 2000s, but it's pretty much fallen into obscurity nowadays, and the only reason why I was even reintroduced to it was because of the lost media that the series has. The biggest of which was probably episode 29, which was a rumored series finale that didn't actually exist, but people thought it existed, and I made a whole trilogy of videos talking about that from a few years ago. So today's topic has to do with more Kablam Lost Media, which is really cool in itself, but this one actually has to do with Halloween, which makes it double cool because we're in October now. From mid-September to early November, so a little more than a month, Nickelodeon ran a block called 101% Spooky Whizbang with Henry and June. As I said earlier, this block featured Halloween-themed shows, and the entire package was that of Halloween, and getting everyone excited for the month of October, but specifically what makes this so interesting and why I'm a big fan of it is because the block itself featured segments of Henry and June that were animated by creator Mark Merrick, and they're entirely original to this block. So this wasn't like rehashed stuff from the TV show, or really like cheap animation. This was like extra Henry and June content from Kablam, and that's really, really cool. Especially considering the fact that there were so many different segments made for this block. And that's kind of where the mystery comes into play here. Over the years, a variety of different shorts have resurfaced, ranging from a barn dance scene to a classroom setting. These shorts really make you feel like you're watching a cartoon within a cartoon, which makes them really entertaining and why I want to find more of them. So that's probably the biggest reason why these are lost and where the search kind of comes into play, because this block ran for so long and there were so many different shorts that were made, we actually have no idea how many exist. And the only ones that have resurfaced came from VHS uploads. So in a way, we're not really trying to find the spooky whizbang block as a whole, but rather these individual shorts that were aired during the block. Now, since these were made by Mark Merrick, you would think that he still has them. However, I'm not sure if anyone's asked him, but he's also never stated that he did have them. And when he released every episode of Kablam on his website a few years ago, there was no mention or trace of these, so I'm not really sure what their status is regarding that. When it comes to VHS uploads though, again, that's probably the best way to find these is if you guys have old VHS tapes from back in the late 90s when this aired, go through them and you might have some commercial breaks or some of the block. But I definitely think that these are worth finding and that there should be a search effort built around them because as I said earlier, Henry and June and Kablam is such a great like Nickelodeon show and a great topic that has had a lot of really cool lost media searches up to this point. So I think finding more content from Henry and June is definitely worth doing. As far as I can tell, the earliest known existence of these shorts was back in 2012, which was eight years ago, so who knows how long it'll be until we actually have a definitive list or can find more of these, but so far, they've been very scattered and the search for them has been very hit or miss. Sometimes that's part of the fun of these like VHS tape lost media searches is that even though it might take a long time to find them, everyone has a chance of having some in their possession because anyone that taped Nickelodeon back then could potentially have these in their archives. And here's hoping more of them can be found. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to check out some of my other game related lost media videos. Thanks for watching, and until next time, Finn.